Just ahead on American Black Journal, a new report shows how Detroit's comeback is perceived by national business leaders and by local residents. Plus, the Detroit Area Agency on Aging gears up to help seniors enjoy the holidays. And we'll take you to a barbershop that brings the community together. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal, partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. A new report is shedding light on how national business leaders and local residents perceive Detroit's revitalization. The 2019 Detroit Reinvestment Index was produced by Detroit Future City, a nonprofit that works to improve the quality of life for Detroiters. Here are some of the highlights from the survey. 46% of national business leaders see Detroit as an excellent business opportunity, and many of them would invest in the city. However, there are still some misconceptions about Detroit's financial situation. 21% of the business leaders thought the city was still in bankruptcy, and 34% thought it was emerging from Chapter 9. Turning to the perceptions of residents, 46% of Detroiters have a more favorable impression of the city today than they did before, while 63% of suburbanites share that same opinion. Joining me now is the Executive Director of Detroit Future City, Anika Goss. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So Steve. those are really interesting numbers, and yeah. there's not a lot of bad news in that. Right. Uh, the, the the misconception about bankruptcy is something that I actually hear from people when I talk to them in other cities. They're like, "How's that bankruptcy going?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, we're five years past that, but right. that's okay, right?" I thought I think we thought that was really interesting. Also, yeah. I think we really thought of it as. Uh, in Detroit, we move past things once we've resolved them, right? right? right. Like, okay, that was over. We did it. We're not yeah. going to talk about it anymore. Right. We're looking towards the future. Yeah. And I think the rest of the con country is really, really expected us to talk about what's happening post-bankruptcy. Yeah. What do we look like now and expecting for us to still talk about it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the perception that people have of the city, of course, is important from a business perspective, people from outside the city. Talk about these business leaders who say, look, this is a great time to invest in Detroit. That's not something we've heard a whole lot over right. the most recent history, I guess. Well, and this year, and so this is the, the fourth year of the reinvestment mm -hmm. index and the Kresge Foundation Foundation uh, sponsored the report and had been actually commissioning uh, the, the survey earlier. Mm -hmm. And we found a 14% increase in uh, national business leaders and how they feel about Detroit over last year. Yeah. So we are really seeing that trend. And I think that I think that's a, something we should really be looking out for, mm -hmm. that we should be promoting and really using to our advantage right now. Yeah. I mean, we still have a lot of barriers to the kinds of investment that you see yeah. in other cities. And I hear still from people in other cities, they're like, yeah, if I were to do that in Detroit, it wouldn't work as well. Uh, but the idea that it's getting better, I think, is is important. And I think you know, success kind of builds on success. Like we're, we're starting to see things work in right. Detroit that didn't work before. Well, I think that I, I I completely agree with that. I think one of the one of the most interesting data points that came out of the report was that the national business leaders felt like when asked 
whether they would prefer a city that was more expensive mm -hmm. but had more amenities for their employees or whether they would prefer a city that was less expensive but had fewer amenities for their employees. Oh. It was almost 50-50. It was like right? 43, 52 or something like that. Uh. So we were really, really surprised by that. Yeah. But I think it also speaks to where Detroit is right now, that it, it's really still seen as a city of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about residents and uh, our perceptions of the city. We, we've got n not only a strong opinion of ourselves, <laughs> uh, but our suburban neighbors who uh, we've always had a kind of tenuous relationship yes. with, strained it sometimes. <laughs> uh, it seems like they're a little more bullish on yeah. our chances. I know, that was pretty cool, <laughs> right? That was they're surprising. still a little hesitant about moving. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and that came out in the survey as yeah. well. They aren't quite ready to move, but they were really excited about what's happening and the changes that are, that are happening. Yeah. I think what was really surprising for us was that we expected... Uh, for Detroiters to say, hey, we're really excited about the new investment that's happening here, right, right. or we're not so excited because we haven't seen any of the investment in my neighborhood specifically. That we expected. Yeah. I think what we didn't expect was the evenness between Detroiters and suburbanites both really thinking positively mm -hmm. about it, new investment in their, in their neighborhoods, but also asking some of the same questions <clears throat> as, as to whether these were the right businesses that were paying the white, right wage and paying or, and offering the kinds of services they need both yeah. in Detroit and in their own neighborhoods in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about your work is taking uh, data like this and translating it to uh, you know, the, the, the way it impacts Detroiters, right. the way it impacts the people who, who live here, and especially those people who are being left behind some of the things that, uh, that we're seeing happen. Uh, tell us how these two things right. kind of relate. Well, um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we understood and tried to make really, really clear in the report was the impact of redevelopment mm -hmm. on renters. Mm -hmm. We really believe that rent <coughs> at Detroit Future City that renters are the most vulnerable population, yes. whether you're a low income renter or moderate, uh, middle income renter or a higher income renter, you are vulnerable to redevelopment change. Yeah. And, and there's nothing that's stable about that. And now that Detroit is a majority renter city, it becomes even more tenuous. That's right. And so what we were surprised about is because there's so much um, talk on social media about gentrification and displacement, but in fact, when asked in this consumer survey, there was actually very few people who had actually been displaced, yeah. but there were a, a lot more people that were fearful of being displaced. Yeah. And if you were a renter, 48% of the renters that we talked to, both in Detroit and then like 28% in the suburbs were all really concerned about potential displacement and fearful of being displaced. Yeah. I think that's something to really, really pay attention to. I'm hoping that investors and uh, city officials will really consider that mm -hmm. as they're thinking about new investment, that renter, how we secure the renter population in Detroit has to be as an, as important as the kind of investment that goes into the city. Yeah, yeah. and and I also, uh, you know, I wonder how much uh, we should be focused on trying to create more owners in yeah. Detroit as well, right? I mean, especially especially at the lower income level, where people are not choosing to rent but are unable to buy. Uh, you know, this was uh, the, the the sort of cradle of single family home ownership, right. uh, especially among African Americans That's for right. such a long time, we should be trying to, to reclaim some it, of that. That's exactly right, Stephen. And it wasn't included in this report, but the loss of wealth of African American homeowners right. is really significant, the highest than it's ever been. And so that's a really important point that the home ownership system right now isn't stable enough to actually uh, create an environment right. for as many homeowners as lost uh, the opportunity over the past 10 years. Yeah. And so having to make an, an, an intentional effort around stabilizing that system, creating more opportunities for homeowners, that's really going to make the difference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's not just about investment, uh, outside investment or 
uh, local investment. It's about directing those investments to the things yeah. that will make a difference. And I feel like sometimes we're not really yeah. clear about uh, what all those things are. Right. I, I do think that sometimes we end up really wanting to focus on what's new and shiny yeah, and exciting right. and outside. And I think, I think what this report also showed was that there are a lot of really strong assets that are here that, are people, that people are excited about and that, really, that they want us to begin to pay attention to. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, congratulations on the work. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Always great to see you. Yeah. Up next, an organization that's helping seniors and the disabled live better lives. But first, here's a 1993 Detroit Black Journal conversation about City of Detroit pension fund investments. Hello, caller. You're on Detroit Black Journal. Hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, I want to say this. I've lived in the city of Detroit all my life, and I've worked in the city of Detroit all my life. Uh, Pension money, money goes where it's treated best. It's, it doesn't go in for any particular group or any particular country. Uh, money's colorblind. Uh, it's not out there for to rebuild Detroit or rebuild a, a building. It's there for to invest it in going businesses. It's not supposed to take a risk. It's there supposed to be for the security of the man who's paid his money into the pension. What do you think about that, Mr. Wilborn? Well, uh, what he says is true. However, uh, I, I really have to take some exception that money is colorblind. Uh, I think that there are people who can walk into the board uh, and almost have carte blanche, and that there are people who have uh, a very difficult time just getting before the board. Mm -hmm. um, what I try as a trustee to do is to provide access to the board. Uh, the money is not there to rebuild Detroit. It, it really isn't. Yet, if someone comes in with a, a viable uh, project that is going to help Detroit, as I say, I favor a mall downtown. Um, I think it's needed as a city employee. I think it will uh, add to the tax base. I think it will secure my job. A pension is no good to someone who uh, is laid off before they become vested and they never receive a pension. Okay. The Detroit Area Agency on Aging is well known for its Meals on Wheels program, but the organization also provides a lot of other services and resources to seniors, adults with disabilities, and caregivers, for example. The agency can help with long-term and in-home care, health and wellness education, housing and transportation resources, and adult daycare. Here to tell us more is the president and CEO. Ronald Taylor. Welcome to American Black Journal. Well, thank you for having me, yeah. Stephen. So I, I have known about Meals on Wheels since uh, I was a volunteer for mm -hmm. it okay. <laughs> when okay. I was in high school. <laughs> uh, but for people who are maybe not as familiar with it, uh, uh, talk about that program, how long it's been around, uh, and how effective it is. Yeah, the, um, the Holiday Meals on Wheels program has actually been around for 31 years, yeah. especially for Thanksgiving. <clears throat> And it's, um, we probably have about 600 volunteers that come out on two day, over two days as far as this year, it'll be the 27th and the 28th. And essentially it's a very much needed program because within, um, as far as some of the federal statistics as we know, there's 10 million individuals that are living with uh, food insecurities and there's over 15 million that are living with, um, in social isolation and over 18 million that are living with as far as that we are considered to be living in poverty. Mm -hmm. And many of those individuals are our neighbors here in this community. So we've been fortunate to receive funding from the uh, Ford Motor Fund this year and to the tune of $50,000 to help uh, deliver over 6,000 meals to some of our most needy, or I won't say needy, but some of those individuals that could um, use a use a meal on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay? So, because what we recognize is that hunger takes no holidays. That's right. Yes. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah, and the 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 trouble or the really challenging thing about food insecurity, I think, right mm -hmm. now is how fluid it is. Uh, the, when people think about 
people not having food, they think it's a constant thing. In other words, That's you either correct. have food That's or you correct. don't. But really, people move in and out of that space all the time. They have food sometimes, That's correct. but not all the time. And the holidays in particular can be really tough. That's people. so true. That is so true. And it's, you know, and, and with the holidays also, there's opportunities for those that don't have food. I mean, that's one issue as far as the food insecurity. But you also have to take a look at it from the emotional aspect of things and then just the opportunities to come together to, to be with family. Mm -hmm. And we have individuals that um, don't have the opportunity to engage as far as to have those family supports, to have those conversations, to have that laugh to have that joy right. and so with through through our delivery of the meals it's an opportunity to go out there and say hi and to put a smile on someone's face and to have some conversations with individuals that may not have that interaction yeah. on a holiday right. or it's, on this Thanksgiving yeah it's something we often take for granted mm -hmm. uh, that we'll be with other people yes. uh, on the holidays uh, the other part of your work that I think is probably changing a lot and people may not be aware of is, is the caregiver yes. space because that's changing for all of us yes. so much. Uh, so many people are being cast into the role of caregiver mm -hmm. when they maybe never imagined themselves having to do that. Yeah, caregiving, it's an, it's an, it's an issue that um, a lot of individuals may not even recognize that they're caregivers mm -hmm. and that they're filling that role because you could be a grandparent raising a grandchild, but you're a caregiver. Mm -hmm. You could just um, be an individual that's loving or taking care of your um, spouse and just, just doing what you feel is your um, your your moral duty and you're 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 providing caregiving services and some estimates have indicated that caregiving is a 400 billion dollar informal insurance program in many ways and but the, one of the things which we have to realize is that we have to provide supports to that caregiver because they can uh, more likely burn themselves out so we are trying to fill that gap or fill that space through respite programs and also support services and also trying to reach out to other entities with in our community to see how we can more effectively provide the resources that um, will allow that individual to continue to uh, provide what I'll say is the, is a selfless love uh -huh. to, to their loved one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much are you finding that you need to educate caregivers about not just what they're doing, but mm -hmm. how to take care of them? Uh, we're finding that that's a, that's a big part of it because a lot of caregivers, um, sometimes they feel guilty for feeling stressed out or for having uh, moments of angst. And what we have to realize is that's a normal part of the process. And so through some of the support groups and uh, some of the other resources in which we can provide, um, it provides an opportunity for the caregiver to get the resources and also to just vent or to speak with others as far as what are some of the other coping mechanisms that you've utilized what are some of the best practices that um, you have embraced? And also we can provide other respite services to say that, hey, I just need some time, some me time, and um, can you take <laughs> care of mom, dad, or my loved one, mm -hmm. or, you know, even my grandchild so that I can just, you know, um, have some time for myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is that where services like the adult daycare, for instance, comes mm -hmm. in, uh, the idea that you can give people time and a break. Yes, it's the adult daycare in which an individual can essentially, you know, um, arrange to have their loved one taken care of while they go out and t go do shopping, go get their nails done, have a spa day, or do whatever it is in which they need to do. So the adult daycare does play a big role in that, but also one of the things which we're really looking at <clears throat> is getting a cadre of volunteers that can actually go into the home and to sit with an individual right. while the caregivers also, you know, may want to run their errands to do other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are some of the other services that uh, people may not know about that you guys? You know, um, that's a great question because <laughs> a lot of folks realize and understand that the Detroit Air Agency on Aging, that we're, um, as far as our Meals on Wheels program mm -hmm. and our Holiday Meals on Wheels program, but we have a, what I'll say is a continuum of services in which we can offer to the community. And I will say everything from senior centers, we have five community wellness centers in which we, um, which we sponsor. And those programs essentially do evidence-based programs, matter of balance, um, 
things with dementia. So it's an opportunity to go and socialize, get a good meal, but also learn about some things that will keep you um, healthy and allow you to age in place. And then the services go through transportation and also some other social recreation. But we, the other end of the continuum, though, we do provide services in the home mm -hmm. as far as um, personal care and, and case management activities. So we pretty much have a, a great uh, uh, continuum mm -hmm. of services in which we can offer to community. Yeah. Uh, how are you uh, finding the challenge of making sure that you have people to be able to do this? The training, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity to become uh, somebody who can do this, I would imagine, mm -hmm. is, uh, is changing as well. Yeah, well, we're fortunate that we have a, um, within, our, within our team, we have a number of social workers and nurses that can go out and do uh, in-home assessments mm -hmm. to see what your situation is from a, what I'll say, a social economical perspective. But then we also have a network of approximately 160 service providers, or I like to call partners, mm -hmm. in which they also serve as part of the umbrella that allows us to reach out to provide services to um, our constituents. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I would, I, know, I can only imagine how much the change uh, in your in your world is is challenging you. So, mm -hmm. congratulations for sticking in there and uh, keeping all these services available to people. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming by. And I would just like to say, if there's if folks have a would like to need services, they can reach us at uh, www.detroitseniorsolutions.org. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll put that info on our website as well. Okay. All right. Thanks for being here. Okay. Thanks so much. All right, finally today, barber shops in the African American community have traditionally been places where men can get way more than a haircut and a shave. It's where stories are shared and wisdom is passed down from one generation to the next. The social club in Detroit takes that barber shop experience to the next level by bringing community together. It's all in the barber shop because I saw, I saw a gap, right? I wanted to create an environment that I felt proud to work in, and I think a lot of barber shops offered the community piece of it, but didn't offer, you know, the kind of career trajectory that I saw for myself. And I saw a lot of barbers also, like, not take pride in where they worked and how they worked, and I wanted to, like, provide that space. It really started solving a problem for myself, and if it was solving a problem for me, then it probably would be solving a problem for other barbers as well. One of those things is belonging. You know, what if we use the barbershop as that place to belong? Because historically, barbershops have been third places. You have work, you have, you know, home life, and then you have this third place that you can go to and connect with people and share ideas on and so forth. Whether it be a coffee shop or a barbershop, you need this place to belong. Do people look like you? Because if nobody in the, in the shop looks like you, then you probably aren't welcome. If we could hire all different types of people, then when somebody walked in, they would see themselves you know you belong. Because if I walk in a bar here and I don't see anybody that looks like me, that's a signal you don't belong here. And I think when you have black ownership, it naturally turns into a place where black people gather and have open, honest conversations about strategy on how to build wealth in your community or how to just be safe in general. You know, the barbershop is the black man's country club, period. Shop talk happen because we would attract all these different individuals across you know racial lines but also across kind of professional lines we, we would have college students we would have college professors we would have athletes entertainers they would have this information they would have these insights and because of the trust built between client and barber they would share some of those insights with us and when they share those insights i just learned something or i just taught something or, you know, we just learned something as a barbershop. And I said, what if, you know, we started to intentionally organize like they did back in the day? What if we organized these talks around what we learned in the shop, right? And it turned into kind of a community classroom where we were able to bring in Grammy Award winning artists or graffiti artists or, you know, athletes and have them tell their story uh, or political officials. And they would tell their story while getting a haircut where our community felt comfortable asking whatever question. Because no matter how famous you are, when you walk into a barbershop, everybody's the same. We're trying to take it to the next level of like, not just sharing and debating, but also teaching. And I think we can do that in a very non-invasive way. 
I think we can do it in a way that's authentic to this space. And I think that uh, we can shake some things up. That's our program for today. You can go to AmericanBlackJournal.org to get more information about our guests and to check out our past episodes. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Everyone should have a great Thanksgiving holiday, and we'll see you next time. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.